the joke is pilots get in the plane, they read their checklist and they take off, they push the button and sit back and wait for the plane to land itself. But when something goes wrong, suddenly the pilot's got to take control and everybody's life's in that pilot's hand. I think autopilot churned off for compensation people 18 months ago. And most of us hopefully have made sure that we're awake and that we're working on things. Don't conduct hey everyone, your it's been Mike, host of We're Only Human, so and I'm so glad you're here with us today. Not defending so, just the tribe, but defending what the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. You know, you're not going to down the line. The trends are there, what's happening, what's changing. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. We're also going to dive into... Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks, host of We're Only Human, and I'm so glad you're here with us today for an episode where we're going to dive into compensation, what the trends are there, what's happening, what's changing, what sorts of data sources we're seeing emerge as interesting and relevant for talent leaders as they're trying to figure out how to adjust comp to keep up with the pace of inflation and other salary demands. Really quickly, I want to let you know that my brand new book, Talent Scarcity, How to Hire and Retain a Shrinking Workforce, just launched in the last week and immediately went straight to number one on the HR books list for Amazon. Such an exciting, exciting week for us. And also a trip to India for my first time. I'm keynoting a conference over there and it has been such a wonderful experience to meet an incredible community of people who is dedicated to serving and loving their employees and their candidates just like any of us would be in the United States. It's been an incredible time to meet them. Just the degree of professionalism, the degree of warmth and kindness from the people here has been so surprising and so wonderful as well. I've just enjoyed it so much. So those are the couple things, quick updates for you. I'll make sure you get the link to the book into the show notes in case you want to go check that out. People are talking about it because the new government data from this, this week came out, said that the economy added half a million new jobs in the U S in the last week. And of course, every time I get a book done, I wonder, is this going to be the right timing? Is it going to be you know, the wrong time because some of the stories about layoffs, things like that. But then we saw 500,000 jobs added just this last week, same week the book came out. And so it feels like talent scarcity is truly the environment that we're in. So I think you'd enjoy the book. Lots of great stories and examples, just like I share here on the podcast. Some of those stories actually from the podcast as well, from the interviews and conversations I've had here. So if you follow the show, you would definitely enjoy the book. I write the same way that I speak. It's not aloof and detached and academic. It's very personal, down to earth, rel- relatable, and so on. So I'll make sure that link is in the show notes. If you want to check the book out and let's get into our conversation with Ryan Briscoe from Marriott on how comp is changing, evolving, and trending and what each of us need to know to do compensation well. Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks, and I'm so glad you're here with us. Looking forward to this conversation today. We're going to talk about some fun stuff, and I'm excited to be joined by Brian Briscoe. Brian, welcome. Glad to have you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Hey, I, again, I, I told you before we started recording, I've been looking forward to this for a while, so I'm excited to finally have the chance to have some conversation, dive into some of the things that are top of mind for you, all that good stuff. So before we get into that conversation, would you take a minute and tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do, please? Yeah, I am the the VP of Global Compensation for Marriott International. So I I would say that worked in compensation pretty much my whole adult life. I've held maybe every HR job that there is between like payroll clerk and administrator to chief people officer at some point. I've worked on the consulting side of business as well as as a practitioner, but I'm pretty happily in my in my sweet spot of, of being a comp leader, which is the happy place of the field that I've grown up in and really enjoy. I, uh, I've been at Marriott off and on over the last 15, 16 years and played different roles, but came back to the company about 10 months ago. So I get to work with a lot of people I know in a different capacity and, and I've had a great time with it, but I'm still always trying to like learn and grow as a compensation person. Absolutely. You talk about comp and I, I can see that you smile when you mention that you work in comp and it excites you, but there's plenty of people probably that would hear that and think, Ooh, there's lots of other things I would rather do. Why is comp so appealing to you? What about it draws you in or gets you excited? 
Yeah. So it's most comp people that I know that really enjoy it fell into it by mistake. I think it's one of those kind of like happy <laughs> accidents to, to end up being a compensation person because it's a field with a lot of analytics. And I would say it's pretty heavy on the math, logic, analytics, statistics side. And a lot of people don't expect that in human resources, but like the deep part about it is you're dealing with human beings, which are incredibly complex entities in and of themselves. Like you're dealing with people, their motivation. So I would say the math is actually more interesting to try to apply because it's harder than what it is with maybe measuring like widgets or just counting money or doing those things because people aren't always rational. So I think the fact that the math is like, we do a lot of math. We try to figure out where a lot of money goes and how to allocate capital, but it's not as easy as it is. And, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying that with a lot of people, but I don't think it's as easy as it is with like asset allocation for a financial investment firm. The money is the money and the investments are shares of stock or things like that. People are far more unique. So I think I like the, just the unending complexity of what happens when you, when people are exposed to different. I completely <laughs> can agree with that. So I've told people often that I, the other path for me, the other career I didn't choose was to be an economist, just understanding why people make decisions. You mentioned they're irrational, right? How they're, if we think, okay, applying a monetary incentive to this person is going to make them do this thing. And they don't do that thing. You're like, what? Well, all the other things should have, what's, yeah. what happened here? And as you said, we are complicated creatures. So that's a really mm -hmm. great answer. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I've never heard anybody say that around the comp stuff, but I can see how that would be absolutely true as a driver and a thing that draws you into it. So one of the things I want to ask you about is in the last year, I've heard more companies talking about comp, more companies thinking about this as a big picture priority, whether it's because it's hard to find people, because of some of the legal stuff that's coming up in different states, things like that. And I'd like to hear from you. Do you think that comp has become more important in the last 12 to 18 months? And if so, how? Yeah, so I think I've just saw some things floating around LinkedIn and I haven't validated them, so I probably shouldn't be sharing them, but I've seen, and there's probably some bias coming from some of my friends in compensation, but a lot of like data points coming out that like spending on compensation within companies has like more than doubled in the last year. And it's one of the fastest growing areas that companies are spending money on in terms of like corporate investment. Some of that is technology and some of that is people and different things is what it looks like. But I think what's really happened is you had a pandemic that was a disruptive factor on things. And so um, it's really obvious to see how like a pandemic impacted like talent acquisition, recruiting efforts and those things because 20 million people lose their jobs. And then within a couple of months, we're trying to hire those 20 million people back into the labor force and wondering where they all went and doing those things. Well, of course, like that's a major disruptive event for compensation. And then you put in the monetary easing and inflationary factors. If you take the United States and if you think about the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, we've had more inflation and impact in the last 18 months than what we had certainly over the last two decades and any other 18 month period, really, really maybe the last three or four decades. So I think where there's a lot of focus on compensation is a lot of companies and a lot of comp professionals probably growing up in the time that I've grown up in compensation up until the last two years, it was, we have a 3% merit budget. We have a, like there, there was just this standard of, we had very low inflation, wages were growing relatively steadily. Everything was normal. It's when everything goes crazy that it suddenly becomes important, right? So if wages are climbing six or 7% a year and inflation is eight or 9% a year compensation, people aren't just trying to explain why there's a difference there, but you're trying to figure out what do you do in your corporate, what do you do in your, uh, in your whole strategy of how to do this, right? There's countries that have had 20, 30, 80% inflation in other parts of the world. If you go outside of the U S there's always a different world, but I think you have places like Argentina or countries, Venezuela, where they've dealt with some long-term big inflationary things. And they're used to giving pay increases every month or every two months or every three months. And for U.S. companies, for professionals, we built entire systems saying every year, everything just moves a little bit. One time. One yes. time. We do one time. We do one review. It's one question. And that's just a formality because we all know that things are just plodding along. So now we have to understand why it is we do our work. We have to question, like, you, there is no, like, autopilot. I think of it like airline pilots. The joke is, like, they get in the plane, they read their checklist, and they take off, they push the button and sit back and wait for the plane to land itself and do that. 
But when the plane hits the birds or something goes wrong, suddenly the pilot's got to take control and everybody's life's in that pilot's hand because the autopilot isn't really configured for that. Yeah. I think autopilot turned off for compensation people 18 months ago. And most of us hopefully have made sure that we're awake and that we're working on things. So I think there's a, it's a very different world. There's certainly different conversations than, than I've ever had in my career over the last couple of months, I'd say. Yeah, I, I was thinking about, I've never done it on the scale that you're doing it of comp, but I think about the conversations I've had, things like that. And I was on a session a few months ago that I was facilitating a conversation between a compensation leader and a recruiting leader. And it was a throwdown because in many cases over the last year, those two audiences have been butting heads or what do you mean? I can't have more budget. I'm sorry, you're maxed out. We've got pay compression over here. And then you put the recruiter saying, yeah, but if you want any of these people that we're supposed to be hiring, I'm going to have to do something about this. And so for me, that was a fun conversation to facilitate because we were drawing out the things that matter to the TA leaders, but also to the comp leaders and say, hey, at the end of the day, we both want to hire the right people. We want to do it fairly. We want to keep those people that are already here. We want to do those things. So that's what we have to be. We can't just say, it's just that I'm just going to throw it down. No, we've got to figure out together how to get to some sort of resolution that's going to work for everybody and not just patch this and create a bigger problem three months later when those people get mad and quit or whatever else. So there's some really interesting dynamics, like you're saying, changing, whether it's macro economic or it's just in each company. The things they're seeing are dramatically changing how they perceive comp, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I think the conversation changed. I think the, the partnership with talent acquisition for comp people has probably been, in most companies, it's probably been underrated. Or I think in a lot of places, it's almost like one side's there to say no and the other side's there to make the case for yes. I won't say which side, but most people that have worked on either of those sides know how it goes. Like for me, an experience I had when I I was at a smaller company, as I went through my midlife career journey and I was running all of HR and I had the talent acquisition team reporting to me and we were trying to do, and I got a very different perspective, I think, looking at how those two work together. And it's not when you step back from the individual, I really need this candidate right now, but they're over my range or they're over my budget. And you look at like, where is that trend or what, what's happening with our time to fill? What's happening with the big picture metrics? There's a lot where compensation needs to work with talent acquisition when it's kind of not the heat of the moment, trying to close the candidate that the, whatever senior vice president wants, like outside of those moments. So I think there's the pandemic and then this sort of inflationary period is probably raising out a lot of those questions and those opportunities. That's a whole conversation probably for a different day, but I think that's an interesting way of putting it, saying the only time we talk shouldn't be when I'm arguing with you over this range or this offer I'm trying to make, but we should be having these conversations on a deeper level to say, hey, here's where I see things going. Are you getting any indicators of what, you know, what's happening? What's the, any idea what this, what's going to be next here? Like having some more proactive forward thinking conversations versus just always reactive. I think that's a really interesting thing to to bring into that. One of the things, so one of the first for the audience listening into this, one of the first things that I had ever seen you post, someone had mentioned your name. I started following you. And I saw you post a piece on LinkedIn. just probably like a year ago now, maybe, but you'd post this piece around, you asked a poll, asking your friends, your colleagues here in, comp, in the comp space about crowdsourced compensation numbers and data sources like that. And so what is the market going that way? Is it just a data point? Is it just a kind of a novelty at this stage, what's the real, I'm completely paraphrasing, but essentially you were saying, what's, is this real or is it just noise right now? And right. I'd love to get your take on that broadly. Again, just your perspective as a compensation practitioner, what are those, what is the value of using crowdsourced or more public data sets, not just the traditional salary surveys we've all relied on yeah. for many years? Yeah. So maybe if I just take a little bit of the journey. So I, I came up, I say with like, my like core compensation training came up in consulting, working for one of the two large, I've worked for both of the two of the largest HR consulting firms that sell a lot of compensation surveys. And I came up working on that side of the business and saw, read, wrote, rewrote, helped clients with lots of white papers about why we use compensation data from salary surveys and between the safe harbor, the compliance stuff, the not using self-reported data 
all of these, the whole litany of things that if you're a compensation professional, there's like this almost like standard can answer of why we don't use like the industry association survey. You don't take the, the data from the clown college on how much clowns should get paid because they have a vested interest in, in marketing how uh, there, there's often some bias in the, in those numbers and those things. Right. But I think as I've gone along and matured and as more data becomes publicly available, there's definitely different sources that are out there. That might be indicators, right? So I would say I'm still firmly in the camp that, and like for my compensation team, we buy a lot of compensation surveys from the big compensation groups and we participate in industry surveys and club surveys. We do a lot more than most people do, but I think there's supplemental data. I think there's data that comes in from around like the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They used to have a lot of lag time 10, 15 years ago that they, there was like a long lag between when they would publish data. It's gotten a lot faster. I think that there is, there's more opportunity in some of the places where the data sets around self-reported data have gotten much larger. I think there's more normalization of some of those. I'll give credit to Paul Ryman, who all, I, I do a lot of presentations and some, some podcasting of our own with to talk about H-1B visa data that has to be published, right? So we there's data that's available for people to, to see what companies are offering H-1B visa workers, for example. That's something that people are attesting to the government to say, this is the salary range that I posted and offered, this is what I did. It's not to say that these things give you the answer as a compensation person or that they replace that data. But when you're looking for like nuances or particularly in the time of year when your salary surveys are old, because we have had in the U.S. this like we do it once a year, like we take the spring data, we get it in the fall, we analyze it, we roll it out the next year. Sometimes by the time we're using it, it's months and we're trying to figure out answers from that. Like 14 month old data doesn't do you a lot of good if inflation is running eight or 9% and the labor market's going crazy and if 40% of people have changed their jobs in the past year. That's essentially the entire market has moved. You might as well be looking at gas prices in the 1980s or something, but, but it's still there. It's maybe not that bad. It's a little bit of an exaggeration, but knowing current data that's available, looking at what's happening with job posting data, because if you know your competitive set and different jobs in the different markets, like I think hourly jobs and management jobs and executive jobs and those, there's different indicators that show up in the marketplace for those. I think learning where those are more or less reliable or where you can see those leading trends, those are some pretty important things. And I think using more and more of that, not to replace what we've done in compensation, but to add to and to supplement and to, to give guidance around trends has been pretty important. I've thought, I've talked about all of these different sources for a while and some of the research we've done. And the way you just put that was truthfully, the survey data we've collected for a long time is a little bit reactive. We see that and we react to it. We respond to it. So these other things you're talking about are a little more, pro more proactive. We're looking at leading indicators of what companies expect to pay people, whether it's visa data or it's data from some of these job postings, other sources like that. So I haven't stopped to think about it that way, but that's a really interesting kind of split there to say, we're not going to just base everything on, okay, we looked at a thousand job postings. We're going to price based on what they put out there because that's risky. But to say, guess what? If it's 10% higher than what we are paying right now, we need to be planning for that. We need to be thinking about that, not be surprised when it, when the data come back from that actual survey we're doing, we find out, oh yeah, it is 10% higher and we're flat footed yeah. versus we were, we already leaning into this, thinking about where's that going to come from? What other places we pull from those kinds of things. So I really like your approach to that saying, this is really directional. It's not replacing, but it's a great self it's a great tool to help us inform the other decisions we're making across the spectrum. And I think trends have been underrated for years. I've looked at salary surveys as not just looking, what does the salary survey say, but what is, how has the same survey matched and the survey changed over the last three years, that kind of thing. How much participation is there? So like I can price an accounting job in one of the major surveys and see how many thousands of incumbents there were from year over year, how much participation there is how much movement there is. Is there any change in the pay mix? There's a lot of stuff that compensation surveys are good for, but like you talk about job posting data, it's one thing to look at a thousand job postings. It's another thing to look at a thousand job postings for the same search every month of the year, right? Or every week and look at it and go, because yes, you might see in June or you might see in November that there's a huge spike in job posting because there's seasonal hiring or something like that. And you don't want to react to that. You don't want to say in the hotel industry, I'm not going to say, <laughs> I'm going to pay all my housekeepers more because there's a, 
a sudden surge in hiring for hourly jobs around the holidays for temporary workers, right? But if I watch that consistently and I look for the same customer service jobs or I look for those same things, I can see the trend and start to have a better educated opinion on those things. Mm -hmm. For sure. Good call out there. Yeah. Okay. So as you mentioned earlier, you've been through a variety of roles. You've touched this different areas of HR and comp. And I'd love to hear from you. Again, I follow you on LinkedIn. I'll make sure you get your LinkedIn link into the show notes so anyone can follow you that wants to because you post a lot of thoughtful and interesting things. But if there's a piece of advice or a recommendation you would give to your peers out there right now, you've already covered some really good ground already. I think they've got some good notes if they're following along like I am. But I'd love to hear from you. Is there a piece of advice on how to do this better when it comes to managing a leading comp or a skill or an approach, something else that you found to be valuable? Anything that you'd like to take this moment and give back to all your friends and peers who are in the space? Yeah, I love the way you phrase that question too. Thanks, Ben. I, like, I think all of this compensation works as a community as a community because it's uh, maybe more so than a lot of other disciplines because we're like we're not allowed to share with each other, but yet like practices can flow freely. I think if you look at 2022 or even late 2021 as huge opportunities to go, like why do we do what we do? Like the same standard. I can't just do a 3% merit and a 2% structure movement every year. Or I can't just do, I can't just follow status. And I think people that were, it's daunting and it was a lot of work, but I think if you look at it as this is an opportunity for us to remember why it is we do what we do, like not just to be on autopilot, like we actually need to fly the plane. I think in 2023, the regulatory environment has changed a lot. I think with pay transparency, I talk to a lot of comp people who are like, and I'm not going to say that there's not a day or two that goes by where I go, man, a lot of governments are making our job more difficult. It's easy to slip into that sort of mindset, but I think of those things all as opportunities, right? Like parameters are changing. The rules are changing. I know a lot of comp people that do not like the idea that we have to publish salary ranges on job posting. It's like a private thing internally. You know what it is? It's a little bit more accountability for us. And it's also an opportunity to learn what other people are posting. There's more information. There's good and bad that comes out of all of that. Yes, I have to share more information, but I also get to see more information of what other people are doing. I get to analyze all of that too. And also how we interact with, you know, like in my case at Marriott, we have a lot of associates or ladies and gentlemen or different groups that we refer to that some people call employees. But how you work with your associates or your the team of people that you support, how you educate them, how you talk to them, how you, I think we're going into a world like a more transparent world means we have to talk to people more like they're adults. And I think in the compensation function, we've hidden behind a curtain of nobody wants to know how people are paid. All our files are secret. <laughs> you can't three people get to see this and this is how we go. And I'm not saying that's all going to change, but I think embracing where the messaging needs to be, embracing the opportunity to talk to people about their careers and their career path. And, you know, I just think about, I had so many great discussions about inflation with like leaders and managers this last year. And I went to like events that we had and talked to managers and listened to what they had to say about this is, this is crazy. How are people going to feed our families? What are we going to do? How do we react to that? How do we like look at our pay mix? Look at those opportunities. Look at how it's impacting the business. Inflation, like we look at inflation until we tend to be like, it's the cost of labor and it's different than inflation. We don't worry about the cost of living, but inflation also impacted a lot of our businesses and it impacted our top line revenues. It impacted our bottom line profits. And how does that tie out to associates or employees or, or whatever you have in your business? I think looking at all of these things as opportunities to be a business partner and a business leader versus just something that's like kind of a new pain in the neck or a new spreadsheet you got to do. The more that you can embrace that, I think the more relevant you become within your business. So that's, that was a long answer, but I think that's where my passion is on that. I don't think that answer surprised me come from you though. As I said a minute ago, I've followed you. I see you share about things that, that are informative that are helpful that are we could pick anything that we want to any trend that's going on and there's a bright and shiny side and there's a downside and mm -hmm. i see you weighing those evenly saying yes this is going to be hard this is going to be a challenge but here's the chance we have here's the opportunity we have and so I, i'm not i don't think i'm surprised to hear that answer from you but i think everybody else out there i hope y'all 
y'all took that note, y'all got that idea there that even we know there's going to be challenges. There's always going to be. It's a default reward, right? Death, taxes, and challenge probably is the other necessity or definite in our life. But to say, I can either commiserate with everybody else about how crummy this is or how challenging it is or how hard it's going to be, or say, there's going to be something good that comes out of this long-term that I'm going to look for. I'm going to keep digging until I find it. And in your case, it's, as you just shared, it's, hey, we have some more data. So we see what's that, what else is happening out there. Or guess what? The candidates come in. It's a shorter recruiting cycle because they're more informed. They're able to make a decision more quickly. All those kinds of things. Managers are able to have a better conversation because they're not, they're not waiting for the other person to ask the question because it's already out there on the table. We can have a discussion now within that range instead of being like, I'm not be the first one to speak up. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. Right. I've had leaders that, that waited this horribly embarrassing length of time acting like that person was going to work for free until finally the person's like, are we going to talk about the actual pay us for this? Or right. what's the expectation here? And that always killed me. I can't step in for you, but you should be having that conversation early on because you're showing them, yes, we know you're a person. <laughs> no one's working for free. Now let's get past that and get to the, the stuff that we need from this, from you and how we can meet each other's needs in this. So there's, I really appreciate that perspective though, as this coming in, this is an opportunity, not just a challenge and taking it that way. is a great piece of advice. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, I appreciate your perspective on it too, Ben. I appreciate mutual respect following you and what you share. So, so thank so, you very much. One of the things I wanted to ask you, bridge that a little bit. I was talking to a, I was talking to someone yesterday about their top pay transparency, which you just mentioned. And they said the mention they meant the, the, the moment they mentioned that to some companies, the lead, the blood drains out of their face. The leaders start getting all sweaty and like, Oh, like, I don't know how to respond to this. And what's interesting is I said, when we actually look at our data, when we talk to employees, we survey the workforce, we ask them about things like transparency, what they're looking for. They don't want to know everything that everybody wants that everybody makes. They don't want to know all that stuff. Some people do, but most of them just say, Hey, I want to know how my pay is calculated. I want to know what it takes to get from point A to point B, the next stop on this train here at this company. I want to know those kinds of things. And if we're being transparent in that way and helping our managers to have those conversations in a fruitful way, that's what's going to lead to better outcomes overall. So when you said transparency a minute ago, that just popped in my head because every chance I get, I beat the drum about that a little bit. And you've talked earlier about the importance of communication as part of this, part of the, the new comp role, if we're going to call it that, right? The new elevated stage the competition leaders are on being better about that, but not just doing it ourselves, but enabling the others, the stakeholders you're working with to be able to be better at sharing those things, I think is an important piece. Anything you'd like to comment on that or am I completely backwards and wrong? Set me straight. No, I think, and that's, that's the biggest area of push for my team. I think I yeah. just came out of a meeting 30 minutes ago where candidly, like in my job, I'm, I certainly feel the pressure from my peers and HR partners to be like, we have to have a better story, not a better story. Like we need to convince people, but like articulating everything that you just said, like how, like, why am I in this position in the range? If I change geographies, how does this work? Like, like how does our company philosophy tie against other company philosophies? Are we like, how are we benchmarking ourselves within the marketplace? Am I, if I want to go work in Silicon Valley, is it, am I like, what happens in those types of things? And that's the biggest like growth area for my team right now and focus and me personally. And I'm having a lot of those conversations. You talk about the interchangeability of the word challenge and opportunity. <laughs> it's certainly the growth area for me for 2023. And, it, and we've been doing a lot in 2022. So I would say that there's two sides to this coin. Here's the thing. I'm a reasonably extroverted compensation person. <laughs> Most people in comp, I would say, if you go through HR departments, the compensation view, like there are some exceptions and I can think of a few people that are out in the middle of the dance floor when there's like a big party. But for the most part, the compensation people are probably leaving early and hanging out at the edge of the wall in the shadows, right? Yes. It's, it's not the it's not the field for the biggest extroverts in, in HR. I think we have to come out of that sort of like hiding behind things. We have to be able to articulate and we also have to listen, right? Like I've spent a lot more time in the last year going out and trying to like just listen to people and not just listen to my HR partners, but listen to the managers and the leaders and let them ask me tough questions. Let me test out like, does this make sense? And going through those things, I think 
getting into that feedback loop of communication versus maybe hiding behind i've got a salary structure or here's a policy or here's a here this is the way we've always done it those types of things that we take exception to, out of range sorry yeah exception yeah <laughs> we don't do red circling anymore sure. so the answer is i think going to okay what is it, what's your underlying problem here and listening to those are always true i think right now in a really volatile environment it's like i think that's before that might have separated like good from great now it's going to be like survivors versus non-survivors because if you're just giving kind of the token answer from 2016 or whenever you last fought through stuff you're not going to be relevant in your business space somebody else is going to come in and offer a different data perspective that an uh, executive likes to hear, and they are going to they're going to run you over. I think that's what's going to. We have to be relevant. Yes, and that's encouraging to hear you talk about the fact that you're not just asking other line of business leaders things like that, but you're talking to some of the managers, some of the people who are everything's passed down right from a policy decision. What I talk one of my favorite things I've talked about in the last year is that many of those things end up being a relationship at the end of the day though that manager and how they interact with their team if they're able to have this conversation if they're able to justify what that raise looks like for that next position because they're they actually understand it and can articulate to use your word if they get those things they that solve some of the problems before they ever start bubbling up to your level because you've equipped yeah. them and you've enabled them either with data or with the right tools or the right just even the right phrases and hey when this comes up here's how you here's how you respond here's how you turn that back into a great opportunity to lead and support this person versus saying, I'll talk to you about that in December when our standard rates cycle comes up and we'll see what happens then. No one wants to hear that. They want to hear at least saying, hey, I've already been thinking about that and here's the factors you need to be considering. And when it comes to that, your performance is rated on A, B, and C. So make sure that those are top of mind for you as you're coming in every week, because that's what we're going to be looking at when it comes time for that. Even cost you nothing, takes 20 seconds, and that person walks away feeling, okay, I've got the keys to this vehicle to take my career where I want to take it because I know what this means for me. So I yeah. love that feedback loop you're talking about, really getting into those leaders and listening to the how they're talking about this and trying to make sure you're explaining not in compensation ease, which we can mm -hmm. fall into easily, but talking about it in a way that they understand and can translate to their own teams. Yeah, that's great. Great, great points. Great advice. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. So I've already mentioned this once. If someone wants to follow you, I told them they could connect you on LinkedIn. Is that okay with you? Is there another yeah. better way or... Yeah, uh, LinkedIn's a great, a great community. I really enjoy that. So like it's probably become a place maybe during the pandemic that started filling in a lot of gaps. For, I think I've been on LinkedIn for a long time, but uh, certainly a lot of HR and compensation people I'm connected to on there. I am not the person that goes out trolling for, can I get to, I don't have a way to monetize followers, so <laughs> I'm not, not looking for it, but I love genuine connection. I'm a very relational person and love to connect with people, love to run into people at conferences or events or just I'm outside the Atlanta area. So if you're in Georgia and you're like, let's meet up for lunch one day or whatever, I try to sometime after the comp cycle, I'll try to. <laughs> my um, okay. Tremendous. I'll make sure and get that link in the show notes and you all heard it here. When you reach out, just tell me you heard him on the podcast and hit him up next time you're in the Atlanta area. If you want to have some lunch, that's an awesome, awesome uh, point of the conversation. Brian, I've really enjoyed this so much. I don't get a chance to nerd out with my friends in comp very often. I end up talking a lot about recruiting and learning the other pieces of this. So this has been such a blast. Thank you for joining me on the show today. Yeah, thanks, Ben. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Absolutely. To everybody else out there, I hope you got some good takeaways and good notes. I know that I did. Make sure you go out there, articulate the work you're doing really well in this, and you'll see the benefits as we talked about today during the show. And we'll catch you again next time on We Are Only Human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I am honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.